La Bourgogne was a story that seemed to overturn every idea of Victorian gallantry, and it horrified the reading public with its brutality. That the ship had sank in a matter of half an hour was not enough to explain its high mortality, but that was swiftly clarified by the surviving passengers who began to tell of a murderous fight as the ship sank beneath the waves. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the only woman of La Bourgogne? Here we are. Enjoy! The steamship La Bourgogne, a friendship bound from New York to Havre, never saw the other ship. The Elsa, a British ship bound for Jamaica, had left New York earlier before the fog had gotten truly thick. But as the conditions grew harder and harder to see ahead, the captain of the Elsa made the prudent choice to anchor until it was safe to travel again. A later inquiry would assure the world that their fog whistle was constantly in use, and the ship's bell was also being rung. It would have been difficult for any attentive ship's crew to have missed her warnings, and yet La Bourgogne sliced into her cleanly, putting a 15-foot wide gash into her bow. Though a fight broke out, with the sailors being blamed for not allowing passengers to get to the boats, while the officers argued with them about it, help was nearby. It swiftly became clear that the crew intended to save themselves, even if it meant leaving the passengers and the officers to their fate. Nearby tugboats rushed to the aid of the swiftly sinking Ailsa. The same could not be said of Le Bogonia, who, after backing out of the bow of the Ailsa, returned to her course as though nothing had happened. Unfortunately, La Bogonia was damaged enough that she was forced to return to New York whether she wanted to or not with her front plates stove in by her impact with the other ship. Here, the captain of La Bogonia would face some very uncomfortable questions about his speed in such conditions, the lack of a frequent fog whistle, and his failure to save anyone from the sinking Elsa. La Bergogna would be repaired, and continue to operate for two more years, but the entire incident would prove to be prophetic. The La Bourgogne had been built originally in 1886 for La Compagnie Générale Transatlantique. At 7,395 tons, she was one of the many passenger liners of her time which were described as floating palaces. Though she had her fair share of accidents, her collision with the Elsa was her second run-in with another ship. She was still a favored ship for travel between France and America. Indeed, in 1897, she was updated and overhauled. Though at one point she had four masts, by 1898, she had two, her main and mizzenmast being removed. Instead of counting on a mixture of sail and steam, they instead placed new, modern, and more powerful engines in her. It would also be said by some sources that during this time, watertight bulkheads had been installed. In compliance with the laws of the United States for passenger vessels of her size operating in their waters. On the other hand, it would later be claimed in court that La Bergogna did not have any watertight bulkheads. In the same court case, it would be said that her lifeboat apparatuses were out of date. On July 2nd, 1889, the La Bergogne left New York City on her return voyage to Le Havre. On board, she had 550 passengers in total. 60 miles south of Sable Island, a small remote island off of Nova Scotia, a dense fog settled around the ship. Just as in the incident with the Elsa, it would later be said that La Bergogne was traveling at unsafe speeds considering the low visibility. 
It would also be alleged that La Compagnie Générale Transatlantique was aware that their ships made a practice of traveling at such speeds, in similar conditions, and did nothing to change the practice. An American court would later estimate that her speed had been about 10 knots at least. Nearby was the Chromatischer, a three-masted iron sailing vessel out of Dunkirk, headed to Philadelphia. In their second-class cabin, Victoire Lacasse thought she had heard something, and she woke up her husband, Adrian. She insisted that he should go up on deck and see what had happened. Adrian Lacasse agreed to go and check, and suggested that, as a precaution, his wife should put on her life vest. Around five in the morning, on July 4th, Captain Henderson of the Chromatishire was in his chart room. His ship was traveling at four knots, since he had ordered her sails reduced due to the poor visibility, and had her fog whistle blowing. He was only alerted to another ship nearby when he heard the distinctive sound of a steamer's whistle. In the early dawn light, and with fog thick all around him, he was not able to tell where the ship was, however. Perhaps a minute later, the Chromatishire rammed into La Bourgogne on the starboard side, amidships. The Chromatishire had her bow torn away, but she remained afloat and was not in any danger. Though the fog was so thick that the people on the Chromatishire could not know as they floated away from the collision, things on La Bourgogne were much more dire. Shortly after the collision, Captain Henderson saw rockets set off from the nearby ship and heard her whistle blow. Thinking that the other ship was offering him assistance after the collision, he responded in kind, only to hear nothing further. Though the blow dealt to La Bourgogne was a fatal one, and almost immediately the ship started to list, with her starboard side getting closer and closer to the water. Adrian Lacasse had been on the deck and seen the collision, and he ran back to the cabin he shared with his wife, telling her that she needed to get dressed immediately and head on deck with him. What met them once they returned to the deck was chaos. As passengers initially rushed to the deck, officers tried to assure them that there was no danger. It is thought that this is one of the reasons none of the first-class passengers would survive the wreck. They seemed to have believed the officers and returned to their cabins, which they were trapped in as the ship went down. Some of the people in steerage were sailors themselves, and then had a better sense of the condition of the ship. As the list grew worse and worse, panic began to set in. The disorder of what happened next was only captured in a fragmented way later in the accounts that were published, and in many cases, the accounts conflict with one another. Matters are not helped by the fact that the Ocean Liner Company forbid their sailors to speak to the press, leaving only the few passengers to survive the wreck to tell of the events that followed. What every account could agree on was the brutality of what they had learned panicked men trying to save their lives were capable of. At first, Captain de Lancle thought to run the ship aground to save it, but the water swiftly flooding in reached the boiler fires and stopped the ship's engines. Some of the passengers and crew had already began to enter lifeboats, while others began to don their life belts. As the ship began to sink stern first, the captain was soon the only officer that anyone could see, where he remained at his post on the bridge. Unfortunately, at least one passenger said that Captain Deloncle had clearly lost his head, and was simply walking up and down the bridge, screaming and swearing. It was later said that the other officers also remained at their posts, but without them in amongst the crowd to direct the evacuation of the ship, it soon became every man for himself. The only officer that was seen directly aiding the passengers was the second mate of the ship who cut loose all of the boats he was able to. Indeed, all of the boats that were successfully launched were later attributed to the second mate, with the exception of one. The last that anyone saw of the second mate, he was standing on the deck with his hand on the rigging, 
seemingly resigned to going down with the ship. If people had good words for the second mate, they were harsh in their condemnation of one of the ship's engineers. Three separate men swore they had heard him say, Damn the passengers, let them save themselves, we save ourselves first. This attitude seems to have been one that was generally held by the crew, though one of the ship's firemen would protest that they had not been able to get near any of the lifeboats due to the press of passengers trying to board them. It was swiftly clear that there were not going to be enough lifeboats, since the port side boats were not accessible due to the list of the sinking ship. Matteo Zurich, an Austrian steerage passenger, was in possession of a large jackknife, which he put to use, cutting free a life raft, which had saved many lives. He would have saved more, but the life raft was the only boat he had been able to reach. He had been on the deck when the collision occurred, and had initially attempted to free several of the lifeboats, only to be driven away by the crew. He would later complain that the crew could have saved more lives if they had cut free the lifeboats on the port side, even though they were not able to be launched. That way, people could have clung to them or climbed in them after the ship sank. It would have been best for all if the other people who had knives used them in such a productive way as Matteo Zurich, but they did not. As the fight over places in lifeboats became more intense, Knives were indeed drawn, but they were used as tools of violence instead of to free more of the boats, seemingly by crew and passengers alike. Bloody brawls began to break out on the deck of the sinking ship, while the priests and pastors on board began to give last rites and pray with those who had realized they were likely to go down with the ship. A Monsieur Chard was returning to France with his wife and children, and having placed them in a lifeboat, he went to find a place for himself in another boat. Just as he was getting in the boat, the ship tipped. The boat was only half freed from its cables, and one end swung loose while the other was still attached to the ship. As a result, everyone in the boat was thrown into the water. At the same time, the ship's funnels gave away, and one of them fell across the lifeboat, that Monsieur Chard had just placed his family in. All aboard the lifeboat were crushed and thrown into the ocean. Monsieur Chard, now the only survivor of his household, found a raft which he would cling to for eight hours. As the ship sank beneath the waves, boats full of passengers that had waited for a crew that never came to cut them free were dragged down with La Bergogna. Among them was a lifeboat with 40 women and no crew members or oars. One man placed his two young sons in a lifeboat, but had not been able to find a place in it himself. He went down with the ship, but was able to swim to the surface, only to not see the boat with his sons on the surface. As the ship went down, the captain had the ship give one last goodbye whistle. The horrors of the morning were not over yet, though. Those in the water were just beginning their fight for their lives. Everywhere, people were trying to find something to cling onto or to find a lifeboat they could climb on. The water was full of people crying and pleading for help. Those in the boats, afraid of being swamped, responded with violence. Instead of allowing even people clinging to ropes off of their boats, the people in the boats cut the ropes beat people off with boat hooks and oars, and fought to prevent anyone else from coming on board. A man and his mother both tried to climb on board a boat, only to be thrown into the water. The man came to the surface to try again. His mother never resurfaced. He estimated in total he was thrown from the boat five times. Another man found an unturned boat and clung to it, when another man joined him, they decided to flip the boat over, only to find that it was full of people who had drowned when the boat had capsized. When the ship had sank, one of the waves had pulled Mrs. Lecas into the water. She grabbed a hold of a nearby half-submerged raft and clung to it, 
but quickly fell unconscious. Mr. Lacasse, seeing his wife go limp and begin to slip from the raft she was holding onto, dove from the sinking ship and grabbed a hold of her. Around him, Mr. Lacasse could see people in distress drowning or falling from the sinking ship, but he was not able to reach them with his raft since he did not have any oars, and he was still having to hold his wife up. It took Mr. Lacasse several minutes to return his wife to consciousness. Another passenger would later join them in holding on to the half-submerged raft, and together they would wait for help. The first hint that the Chromatishire would receive that something tragic had happened to the ship they had collided with was when two lifeboats found them. The ship turned around, though it took some time, especially in her damaged condition, and they turned back to the site of the accident. As the fog finally began to clear, the Chromatishire was faced with the full horrors of what had happened in their wake and began rescue work. Their ship's boats began to pull the living out of the water, many of whom had been in boats or clinging to wreckage and rafts for the past eight hours. A couple of hours after picking up the survivors, the wounded Chromatishire was found by the steamer, the Grecian, who took her in tow to Halifax. Many of the passengers and crew would remain on the Grecian and travel on her back to New York, where they had begun their voyage. The exception were Mr. and Mrs. Lacasse, who declared that they had had enough of ships, and instead chose to take the train. As the crew arrived in New York, the crowd, having already learned of what had occurred, showed open hostility as they entered the city. It became clear that public opinion was against them. The passengers who had survived were more than willing to point out the individual members of the crew as well as fellow passengers, who they had witnessed committing acts of brutality. If they had hoped they would face justice, they would be disappointed. Swiftly, the shipping line told the entire crew not to speak to anyone, and many newspaper reporters found that if they attempted to question the crew, all of them would claim to not speak English. If they found interpreters to attempt to speak with them, other crew members would interfere. The shipping line hurriedly brought them back to France. In France, the inquest into the matter would claim that all of the act of barbarity had been the actions of Italians and Austrians, who had been traveling in steerage, and not the acts of the French crew. It was a narrative that was soon adopted by other news sources as well. In the telling of the story, soon, people were reduced to their nationality rather than their individual actions. None of the passengers who had made accusations against the crew were called to testify before the French authorities. Unfortunately for the owners of La Bregogna, this was not going to be the end of it. Initially, they attempted to sue the owners of the Chromatishire for the loss of their ship, but they not only lost, but the court found that the owners of La Bregogna owed the owners of the Chromatishire instead. It would be the first of a series of losses in the courts. Though in France the courts had determined no wrongdoing by La Bregogna, the American courts disagreed, as did an inquest held in Halifax, citing the finding of excessive speed in unsafe conditions. The loss of life as well as the loss of personal belongings, was found to be something that La Compagnie Générale Transatlantique was liable for. The court battles would last for years, but the findings remained the same. The horrors of the wreck are best described in stark numbers, because in some ways they paint the clearest picture. Out of 725 total people on board, only 163 people survived. Of the survivors, 12 were second-class passengers, 47 were steerage class, and the remaining 105 survivors were members of the crew. It was later written that one of the lifeboats only had crew members on it, 
Only one officer survived, the purser, but he had gone down with the ship and had only survived because he was a strong swimmer. None of the children on the ship survived. Out of the estimated 300 female passengers on board, only one, Mrs. Lacasse, would live to tell of her experiences. The reading public was both fascinated and horrified as more and more accounts of the sinking of La Bergogna began to be published in the newspapers. Every paper emblazoned their pages with the news that only one survivor was female. Public interest was at a peak. How had Victoire Lacasse survived while all of the other women had fallen victim to the wreck? Reporters found her and her husband on the train they were taking and asked her why it was that she was the only woman to be saved. Her response was a strong one. Better to ask why my husband was the only man aboard who was man enough to save a woman. For more information about some of the legal ramifications following the wreck, please see the American Bar Association Journal from March 1962, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.